Hey everyone, it is Wednesday. That means it's hump day happy hour time with Dennis in the know. This is your backstage pass for current trends, politics, and education in the dental world. It's live and over a cocktail. Today, the old famous red solo cup might sound a little bit punchy today, and it's because we were up at about 3.30, was on a uh, 5.30 a.m. flight from Boston this morning. Uh, on the way back into Myrtle Beach, saw patients today, and uh, it's just been one of those long days. But I'm excited to be here. I know my buddy Chad is excited to be here too, and I think Chad is lurking in the background. We'll bring him up. And tonight, Dr. Jennifer Bell, unfortunately, will not be with us because she is on her way to Germany. That's a story in and of itself, but uh, we wish Jennifer a great trip over to Germany. Uh, but anyway, you know what our routine is here. We are all dentists, we are all educators, and we are all business owners. Our job is to bring all of you in the know. And tonight we have an incredible guest that I'm so excited to be able to share with you. Um, he has his own site called Real World Dentistry. I don't want to get into too much. All I'm going to leave you with, or all I'm going to tease you with, I should say, is that this guy put a friggin' implant in on himself with a robot. So I'll leave it at that. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But Chad, how you doing, brother? Man, I, I am uh, I am doing pretty good. We got things kind of straightened out at the office, but uh, I'll tell you, I'm excited about our guest tonight too, man. I've been kind of chasing him around for the past several months, trying to get him on the show, and he's had you know a lot of things going on in his practice. But you know, you meet these people on social media, and you're like, this guy's got it going on, and uh, Dr. Yang definitely does. So really excited to have him on the show and. Um, Me too. And I'm actually glad that uh, that Jennifer's not here tonight because I, I get to do the news in a little bit. And that's going to be an interesting situation within itself. And we just lost all our viewers. Yeah, we probably <laughs> did. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, we really miss Jennifer Bell. So, course, you know, it is do. what it is. Well, I think we have a special treat for everyone. So, again, as, as Chad told you, um, we have Dr. David Yang, who's... You know, absolutely. He's going to share a story uh, with us. You know, he just went through some uh, medical tribulations himself, um, you know, and, and I know it's not something that we often think of, but but I know that uh, that when we have these encounters with, uh, you know, with the reality of, uh, of being human, that sometimes it, it can kind of ground us. So I know he's going to share some of those stories, um, but also some of his great insights uh, as a practitioner and about robotic dentistry. And, and maybe we'll even uh, tease out a little bit of 3D printing, which I asked about this week. So, but uh, on, on another note, we, um, we have a special newscaster tonight. Uh, I think his name is Chad Chatterson. Yes, and that's uh, he's he's gonna give it a go, and uh, I'm sure. Well, you know what? Let me not even say that. I'm sure we're all gonna want Jennifer back anyway. But uh, why don't you give her a go there, Chad? I will, Jeff. So tonight, I actually found a couple. Of, I'm gonna leave you up here, Jeff, because you know you can share this with me. But I actually found oh. a couple of news segments that may be of interest to everybody. So there's been a lot of chatter this week in the American Dental Association. And one of the first things that they released recently is the evidence-based clinical practice guideline on restorative treatments for carious lesions. Two important recommendations of this guideline highlight the prioritization of more conservative carious treatment to treat advanced carious lesions on primary and permanent teeth over non-conservative curious treatments. A paradigm shift in the last 20 years to preserve healthy tooth structure has changed how clinicians should treat advanced lesions. Although the panel acknowledges decisions regarding curious treatment approaches may be based on early clinical education, 
Learned behaviors and preferences, they suggest placing a greater emphasis on the evidence of increased risk of experiencing outcomes such as pulp exposure when all carious tissues are removed. The panel urges clinicians to use more conservative treatment approaches that align with restorative dentistry's two main aims, preserving healthy tooth structure and protecting the pulp dentin complex. Now, that is read verbatim from their article that they released on the evidence-based clinical practice guideline on restorative treatments for carious lesions. I will tell you this. I have read guidelines before. I'm not really sure what's changed in dentistry, and I will give five bucks to the first person who actually understands what the hell they're trying to say, because I read through it all, and it was one of the most confusing articles that I've ever read, so I'm not really sure what's changed, but I'm going to give kudos to the ADA for changing whatever they felt necessary to be changed. And I would love to have somebody come on and tell us exactly what the hell they changed. So with that being said, I'm going to go on to our second piece of news, which actually is a little bit more interesting. For those of you that watch any of the popular news channels or maybe listen to them on Sirius XM, there's a commercial that drives me absolutely freaking nuts. And it says... For those of you that have been exposed to aqueous film foaming solution used to fight fires, please call in and join our class action settlement lawsuit. Well, actually, if you look into this, there's a little bit more to that because 3M this past week has just thrown in the towel and reached a tentative $10.3 billion deal over U.S. Forever Chemicals claims. So basically, they're going to provide funds over a 13-year period to cities, towns, and other public water systems to test and treat contamination of PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAs, which was a main ingredient in the aqueous film forming, foaming solutions, whatever it is that was used to fight fires. Now, I want to bring this up. And as you read the article, I find it very interesting because I want to point out two things. One is, is that when this was done, I truly believe that there was no knowledge of the danger that was being posed to society. Secondly, I want to reiterate This is the 3M Corporation, which is a mega corporation and not the 3M oral health portion of the corporation. 3M is a wonderful company that we should all work with. They make fantastic products. They make fantastic cements. They make fantastic zirconias, polishers, abrasives, and so on and so forth. 3M is a wonderful company. This is just the kind of crap that companies have to deal with when they get so large and some lawyers go chasing after them for something that happened numerous years ago. So in all honesty, my heart kind of goes out to 3M. I don't think they knew what they were doing at the time they were doing it because I know they're a wonderful company and I know that they look out for their consumers as well as the public. And then finally, we're going to come back to the ADA for just a second. Apparently, The ADA released something a couple of weeks ago, and it was a guest editorial, and it it was a commentary on value-based care in dentistry. And so they released it, and apparently there was a lot of discussion about it that was like, holy crap, what's happening to my profession? So the ADA came back and basically retracted that statement, and they're, they're clarifying the intent of that commentary. And it says, our recent editorial, value-based care in dentistry is the future here, has sparked quite the reaction amongst the provider community. We have received lots of feedback to various forums with a wide variety of opinions and reactions. Value-based care in dentistry is an approach that prioritizes the patient's needs and uses evidence-based practices to deliver high-quality care. This is a future, the future. Let us bring it a step closer. All right, so let's take a look at that for just a second. This was in the original article. We'll go to slide one first. The elements of value-based care. P, 
patient-centered care focused on prevention, evidence-based practice, integrated, integrated care, continuous improvement. I would say that that is pretty much what we try to do in our everyday practice. The next slide is steps to dental care providers can take to navigate value-based care. Embrace it. Be prepared. Lead it. And be an early adopter. So I'm just wondering when you throw a message out like that, as long as, as well as a flow chart that describes how to go <laughs> from a fee for service practice to a value based practice, how in the hell can you retract it? Because it seems pretty solid in there that that's where they'd like to see dentistry go. I've been a member of the ADA for a number of years, I'm a proud member of the AGD as well. And I would say that, folks, this is not where we want dentistry to go. I believe dentistry always has some sort of a value base, but I don't think we should ever cheapen the services that we provide. Whether I misinterpreted it, I think I read it pretty clearly in the charts that they provided. So I hope that we will all continue to provide value added dental care in our practices. And, folks, that's the freaking news. Nicely, nicely done, Chad. Nicely done. Now, I will say this, that do you think that some of that messaging is more or less a response to a lot of um, a, a lot of the corporate presence that's there that 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 maybe that is their way to to push back against the corporate feel of what's happening in the dental world right now. I don't know, Jeff. I was rather confused by both articles that I presented. I read well, it was it was obvious you were confused and, by the first one. <laughs> and you know, the thing is, is that you read it and the guidelines, I mean, Jennifer posted it today in the forum and I and just just to clarify, I had found it before she posted it. I was so freaking confused at the messaging they were trying to provide. And then when I read that other one, I completely agree with the first flow chart. I completely agree because that's the quality of care. And I, I agree with both of them that the messaging is minimally invasive dentistry. If that's the case, then by God, we should all be practicing minimally invasive dentistry. But that's not a response to DSOs. I'm, I, I'm sorry. I don't think that it is. Where I disagree is that they're pushing something on us and they're telling us to embrace it, to lead it, to be an early adopter of it. I think that we need autonomy as dentists. And I think that we always need to do what's in the best interest of our patients, keeping minimally invasive dentistry at the forefront. And, and so I, I guess my, my response to that is, again, haven't we always been a value-based profession? Right. I, I feel like we have always been a value based profession for the most part. Why why do they feel that now is the time to come and say, oh, my gosh, we have to start creating this other value. And then they're adding a lot of emotional components there. The whole second yeah. page was all emotional components. The first exactly. page was like, here's what you need to do. But the second page is like all emotional stuff. So it, it it's just, a, it's a strange message is what it, it is. It is a very strange message, but here's the problem that I have. The biggest problem that I have is today. I got two or yesterday and today, one yesterday, one today, I got two advertisements for healthcare and dental care at Walmart, healthcare and dental care at Walmart. And then we're going and we're, and I'm reading this article on value-based dentistry What's the real definition and what are we really trying to put out there? Because I believe that we're a value add profession. And, and I'm sorry, man, I'm passionate about it because it kind of pisses me off. I can tell. But you know what? That's what we're here for. We <laughs> are emotional guys, for. too. We can be as emotional as they are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, Chad. What? Why don't you introduce? Good job on the news, by the way. I gotta, <laughs> hey, thanks, I gotta man. give you one out of boy for that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry. I went guest, over. I'm gonna introduce our guest. I'm super excited to have Dr. David Yang here. 
One of my favorite things about him is his email address, which is his middle initial is K and his, his email address is DK Yanger. I was like, this is awesome, man. We're, we're going back to uh, breakfast club days, but I, I love the, the fact that David throws him out, himself out there every single day on the internet. He has a wonderful presence. He started a wonderful group called real world dentistry. Um, all I'm going to tell you is that he did a residency at uh, UCLA because the rest speaks for itself. David's a wonderful dentist. He's out of Arizona, and here he is. David, thank you for being here, man. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm surprised you guys invited me. <laughs> uh, hey, man. Yeah. yeah, we're 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 really you know it's we should have met like three times at the Sprint Ray events, but they always send them to me like two weeks before, and I'm like, dude, I can't go. I can't go. <laughs> I can't go, but, uh, every day, man, you're throwing yourself out there. I mean, just today, uh, I want to talk about one, well, two of your posts today, but there was a post today where let's start up here. Let's start off at 3d printing. Uh, was that a flex Sarah crown that you posted today? Uh, no, uh, the case that I posted today was, um, the new sprint ray, uh, ceramic crown. All right. So is that a hybrid ceramic, like, uh, like, yeah, ceramic filled resin that's printed? So as again, as you guys know, um, the beginning of the year, ADA has changed their definition of what permanent crown is. So, uh, for 2740, um, you know, permanent crown basically is any, um, any ceramic material that is filled more than 50%. Um, and that's what Sprint Ray ceramic uh, okay. resin crown is, is basically it's, it has um, their fill materials is greater than like 51% ceramic. So it's, uh, a, you know, um, you know, people can call it hybrid or people can call it, you know, permanent crown, whatever it is for eight, for as far as ADA is concerned. Uh, that's a permanent crown. I love it. And I've been I've been lecturing on these since 2013, 2014. And I think in 2016, the ADA made a big leap on that and allowed us to start classifying things as ceramics. But um, tell us a little bit about the material and, you know, what you think of it. And uh, and, and I, I'm also going to throw out there, dude, I, I've been a little leery, but I love how you said you know, basically, I'm going to sum it up. The jury's still out. I'm, I'm not going to say it's, 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 it's definitive until I've got a little bit more research. So tell us a little bit about it. So, you know, uh, I've been around long enough and I am, you know, a diehard Surak fan. So, um, you know, I've been around when, uh, you know, Lava Ultimate was around and, um, you know, we had Sultra Duovers and, whatever have you so but i've seen and gone through all that where you know um things that were very i'm gonna interrupt and say that almost worked out like the aqueous film foam yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry right, right and so you know we have material that doesn't work out um but you know the same thing with this material is that someone has to test it you know someone has to be out there there's a and you know, it's not something that I would say, hey, for the young dentist, go and throw a couple hundred in there and figure it out, see if it's going to work for you. Um, if you have to have all this redo, that's that's not a practice builder. Whereas some of us, you know, some of us who've been around, around a while, we can't, you know, we, you know, we have a relationship with our patients and my patients understand that. You know, my office always deal with new technologies. We're always bringing things in. Sometimes, um, you know, things don't work out. Uh, obviously, they know that I stand behind my work and I'll go ahead and replace it for them. Of so, course. Yeah. So they feel more comfortable. Um, you know, so that's what I tell them. I'm like, hey, well, I got this new, you know, we've been milling this crown for, you know, last 15 years. But now, hey, here's the. 3D printer because all patients think that when they come in, they're like, oh, you crown gets sent done on the same day. Oh, you 3D print it? I'm like, now I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 3D yeah. Print it. And so what I tell 
most people is like, hey, actually the material has surpassed my expectation, you know, just far as um, my crown margins, you know, every time I get an x-ray just right on, um, you know, designs are great. And also, you know, just the feel of it, um, everything seems like it's all there, right? Um, now, but, you know, we won't know until, you know, you call me back in two to five years. I will mm -hmm. really let you know if this thing stands up, you know, this test of time. Because, you know, if it doesn't, I'm going to just come back and say, look, um, yeah, it doesn't work. You don't have to say I told you so because I already knew going in that I am, you know, testing these materials and do I always think it's going to be work out the first time? No, but we are going to learn from it one way or the other, right? We're going to go and test the material. If it doesn't work out, then here comes the next material that, that it's going to work out because, and 3D printing like it or not is the future because, you know, when you look at Surax stuff, you know, it's, we'll have new stuff coming up maybe every two years or so. And, you know, uh, we're, we slowly move and get better and better. Whereas you look at 3d printing, I mean, just look at the spin rate company, how many, um, printers they've come out in two years, you know, yeah. it's like moon ray to now it's like night and day. That's two years folks. So, and the material is jumping leaps and bounds. So that's where, you know, the excitement goes. It's not that I don't love Serac. I love Serac. I love Emacs. I love Zirconia. You know, I'm not going away from those anytime soon, but it's really exciting time to be in dentistry. You know, it's, it's funny that you say that. So I, I'll tell you a little story. I've been down the road with a lot of the hybrid ceramics that you mentioned. Um, I've had success. I've had failures. But recently, um, as of March of this year, we finished a five-year study with Rella and Gordon Christensen where we followed the success of hybrid ceramic restorations that were full coverage and bonded in place. And I think the failure always lies in the bonding protocol. And I think that's what we lacked in 2013, 2014, 2015. And, um, you know, I'm proud to say that the ones that were my patients, there were zero D bonds, zero marginal integrity lost, uh, zero failures. They wore like natural teeth. They still remained polished. They're looking good. And so that's one thing that Sprint Ray's got going for them and the other companies that are fabricating these these 3d printed resin crowns or uh, you know hybrid crowns whatever you want to call them i know there's a number of different names i think the future is bright but i you know as we would all sit here and agree emacs and zirconia are always going to be stronger but the future is going to tell what's better so and I completely agree 100% with the bonding protocols because people ask me how am I, you know, cementing this thing in. I'm like, it's like Emacs. I, I, it's yeah. under my bonding protocol because that's going to really tell me how long it's going to last. And, you know, I'm going to have issues because Emacs was the same thing when I first got it. I'm like, oh, let me just try cementing it in how yeah. long it lasts. <laughs> and, you know, like yeah. that's why people still have this thing where like Emacs, I don't use it on my second molar. Use it every day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and your preps are probably good too. But <laughs> the biggest fear that I have is, you know, uh, I don't know who the manufacturer is, but the 3D printed resin that's called Flexera, that just makes me cringe. I'm like, change the name, change the name, <laughs> change the name. We don't want flexing. Please change the name. <laughs> so, uh, hey, tell David. us. Yeah, yeah, let me, go ahead. Let, yeah, let me let me jump in because um, for those who may be listening to you for the first time, David, um, and and I know a lot of people know you from real world dentistry. I mean, you're a name that's been out there for a while, but I still love when we have new listeners and and new people tuning in. I love for them to hear the background of our guests. So maybe just give us a, a quick overview of your your first dive into technology and and kind of the the path that you took in your practice 
integrating technology and and how it's worked out and you know maybe some of the the goods and 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 the bads of of what you've experienced there because i would like to keep talking about some of the other technologies that you've worked with the uh, robotic um you know robotic dentistry and 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 some of the other technologies as well yeah before you get started that's jeff's really nice way of saying hey chad you didn't read his bio so why don't you go ahead and tell us about yourself, David? <laughs> yeah and um you did a great job on the news and your hair looks nice tonight chad <laughs> you know I, I think a lot of us um just the people in the profession i i, I think we're geared to um you know we love toys you know, it, it just, you know, everything from composites, how things ha handle, you know, we, you know, I go and play with, you know, if somebody brings me a sample, I'm touching it and playing with it and see, you know, what the consistency is, you know, same thing with technology, technology comes out and you're like, okay, you know, how can this benefit me? Um, and when I was younger, I was more focused on ROI, return on, you know, my, my investment and you know how is this going to advance my um practice forward uh well i would say one of the you know you know when i started back in 2005 oh, the office was nice we were still taking um you know regular films that were you know we were developing them um you know we did not you know the same thing as panel um you know that's that's like you know i can't even imagine it these days but I know, that's right? how we all started um you know so the first thing we did was upgrade our um you know digital technology far as x-rays go and we put a digital pan in and you know we saw the benefits right away you know being able to diagnose um carries that i just weren't wasn't able to see on a regular x-ray um, you know, that, and that's, that's a huge benefit for our patients when I can, you know, talk about minimal uh, uh, dentistry, you know, when we can detect things, carries in a small setting, then we can do a, you know, uh, filling or we can do a, you know, fluoride, whatever uh, it leads us to do. So that was step one. Step two was um, purchase the VS member. I still have it. Um, it's a big doorstop, but I, I, I have a original iTero um, where you go ahead and basically you take pictures and uh, click, 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 yeah, click, 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 and it stitches them together for you. And, you know, we start sending those out and I thought, oh my God, look at where dentistry is. This stuff is yeah. amazing. Now I just have a sign on it. It's a big doorstop that says I identify myself as a prime scan. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so so it, it, I you know it just kind of reminder where where we came from so you know and then you know um uh my Patterson rep came in and they were always trying to get me down to Scottsdale to uh look at um you know uh, for a workshop for uh the Surac system and I I knew a little bit about it. So I would always tell her, don't come in to my practice again, talking about Surak, unless you guys get rid of one, the powder, two, the photos that they're gonna stitch together. I need it to be in video form and it needs to be in color and I need the spray to disappear. Once you guys have that, I will seriously think about purchasing it. And I saw her walking one day with the big old smile on her face. I'm like, oh, my God, they did it. So that was the Omnicam. You, so, you were smarter than me. I powdered for a long I did, time. too. I did, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, you know, so so I didn't get into the whole Surak game until then. I You know, I just like, you know, I had the Itero and I just didn't see the need for you know, in-house mill and doing, all, you know, all these things. And I, unfortunately, a lot of technology gets a bad name because a lot of people don't know how to use it. And, exactly. And you see the results of it in your practice. Because, you know, like, I'm like, I, I patients come in, things are broken, things are falling out. 
and I look at them and I ask them like, you know, who, you know, who did this? The well, you know, this doctor had this new technology where it was made the same day. I'm like, I am never buying that because, mm-hmm. you know, I, they just keep ending up in my practice. And then you find out, you know, and back then, yeah, we were terrible at bonding protocols and knowing how to do things. And, and I was actually no different. Even when I bought the Omnicam, I'm like, why is my crown falling out? Why is this thing breaking? Why is my crown, you know, there's black color under my crown. You know, all those things, I, I went through it just like other people. So I, I never really, you know, come down on people who, you know, don't understand what's going on because, you know, unless you have some nice person showing you all this stuff, you're going to have to kind of figure it out uh, yourself, and which I did. Um, and, you know, it's an amazing piece of technology. So, you know, and then you get into implants and you got to have, you know, I'm like, well, I'm not placing in an implant without a cone beam. Just not going to do it. So I have never placed. Did you, did you say that? Because it, it, you know, I, I kind of wish the field had evolved more that way, but it didn't. I mean, we really kind of brought cone beam in back door. You know, we didn't have the technology when a lot of the original implant work was being done, but but certainly for you know for general dentists getting into it, I think that was a real game changer that that allowed us. And forgive me for using that term; I know that gets thrown around a lot, but but I really think that that's something that allowed us to to really do a better job of planning and make the implant process a lot more idiot proof. So kudos to you for saying that and, and realizing that because a lot of us learn implants really, um, I started doing mini before we were doing um, home beam imaging, but, but didn't place implants until after cone beam imaging, um, but wish I had had, cone beam imaging for my, even for my mini implants, uh, because the mistakes that we made were, were just incredible. So kudos to you, you know, just seems like you had a, a good eye for, for realizing the, the natural order of things. Yeah. Well, I also, you know, practice and live in a small town. So you screw up one thing, everybody knows. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of the fear came in. It's more than like, Oh, I'm going to hit a nerve. I'm going to put perfect into sinus. It was more like I screw up one case, half the town's going to find out. So, you know, I, I've already, you know, so, you know, I had a healthy fear that if I'm going to do things right, especially running a fee for service practice, that you need to do it right the first time. So, um, you know, that's how I got into using a cone beam. And then, you know, then I'm like, well, I'm doing this root canal. I wonder how many canal there are. I wonder if I can see it with my cone beam. And then you go in there going, wow. You know, I'm like, I can tell there's three, four, five canals. And I know where the pulp chambers is exactly located. I can measure the length of, you know, it, it just made it so simple. So I started taking, you know, cone beams on all my you know, root canal patients and people always go like, well, how does it work out so well for you? Because I cheat with the cone beam every day. You know, mm-hmm. I, you know, I mean, I use, you know, I, I have microscopes and all that good stuff, but it's, it's still not good as where my cone beam could help me out. You know, I know where the curvatures are. I, it's, you know, I know when things are, you know, calcified. So, you know, that's why I always tell people, hey, use your comb beam, use your comb beam, use your comb beam, you know, and, and it's fantastic. So um, I'm a big proponent for that. And, you know, which, you know, and people go, how did I end up um, purchasing the Yomi? Well, the same guy who sold me my Surax system. Matt? <laughs> no. No, okay. Move, moved on um, to Dave, some- David. Tell tell everyone just so uh, just for everyone out there, what everyone might not know what the Yomi is. Oh, who's getting a call? Let let, let, let me answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for calling Domino's Home of the Extravaganza. How may I help you? <laughs> so, um, so Yomi is. Um, 
basically a heptic robotic system where, um, you know, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know why this is happening. Um, that's okay. It's life, man. That's, yeah. that's 2023 baby. Yeah. Uh, it keeps basically, um, you know, we're able to place implants, um, based on a CBCT where once you design it on computer, this robot allows you to only place it where you designed it. So how does, how uh, that happens is that, so you will go ahead and attach a, if I'm placing, so what I did was, you know, I, I decided when I was going to purchase this machine, I, I was going to go ahead and place an implant on myself because I needed an implant on tooth number 30. So I think that was a way to, for me to advertise, get a free advertisement. So that, that was, a, I already had that in my thought. So the way it works is that I will go ahead and put a tracking arm um, piece to, to the left. Um, it's, it's JB. She can't stand it. She can't stand not being somewhere over the Atlantic right now. She's good. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, JB, they said no internet calling. They said no yeah. web calls on the airplane. So basically, um, I had attached this tracking arm to the left side um, of my mouth, and we took a CBCT with it. And with that CBCT, it gets loaded onto the Yomi computer, and um, I went and designed the implant on tooth number 30. So when the Yomi gets attached, one arm gets attached to the tracking arm, and then the other arm has the <clears throat> implant drill. So uh, once that happens, it basically syncs together so that the Yomi uh, knows exactly where all my teeth are, where my nerve is. And so if I turn my head to the left, the handpiece will follow me to the left. If I turn to the right, same thing up and down. So because people are always wondering, like, they think I, you know, I put that handpiece where it's set. And then, you know, we just drill. And so that if I, you know, would have coughed or moved, you know, hey, you know, we're screwed. That's not it. It's basically tracking you the entire time. And if I have it going down my bone and, and let's say we uh, planned a 12 millimeter implant, when you drill, it doesn't matter how hard you press, you are not going to get past that 12 millimeters. So, you know, and so I actually did that when I went and placed it. Uh, first drill, I tried to push, mm -hmm. you know, down further. I couldn't do it. On yourself? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. So I'm going to go it. ahead and try and induce inferior <laughs> alveolar I, trauma. I, 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 right, right. I, I, I'm just going to say this, Chad. Our, our guest has a set. Yeah, he does, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so you couldn't move left, right. You can, you know, it just goes in and out, and you come back out, and then you switch um, drill set, and then you measure same thing. Give gives gives information to the Yomi. You come back, and it's literally, you know, ABC one two three idiot proof. Yeah, I was gonna say it sounds pretty foolproof. That's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. is the restoration in function now? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that's an interesting story. Oh, shit. So <laughs> I placed the implant two weeks later. I take my son to his orthodontist uh, first visit. And he sits down and says, dad, a few years ago, you promised me that you would get braces at the same time as I do. And I'm oh, like, shit. This is like, he, that's when it was like five. How does he even remember? I promised him that stuff. So I said, yeah, okay. So, so I sat down and I got, um, you know, they took get, you know, panel and x-rays and all that stuff. And so they saw my implant. They're like, when did you place that? I'm like, two weeks ago. I'm like, well, can you take that out? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, it hasn't fully integrated. He goes, well, we can move the, you know, because I have I have my third molar too. So they said, well, we can move 31 and 32 into that spot and you don't need an implant. I'm like, ah, okay. So I went back to the office and, and I unscrewed and, and torqued it back out. Oh my God. <laughs> You're freaking nuts, dude. Were you were you totally numb when you did this? Yeah. yeah. I was numb. I had just given my share for the you know, it's just just the bone. So you just you just you don't have to give an IA or anything. Jeff, Jeff, yeah. the son, the pair just grew. Yeah, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> the They're pair just grew. <laughs> the pair just grew. Well, hey, we've talked a lot of technology, man. I want to, um, I want to get serious for a second and, um, something that you mentioned a few weeks ago and, and maybe it's linking to the ear pictures today. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about those, but I want to, I want you to kind of, if you don't mind, tell your story because, I think there's a lot of people that can benefit from this. I mean, you had to take a lot of time off from work and you've got a pretty damn good attitude about it. So if you don't mind, tell the ear pictures first and then tell your story with your, uh, with your heart. Yeah, it, it was, it was kind of funny because um, I have a patient that came in, uh, was it yesterday? Um, I yesterday took, and today, two to two yeah. people, right? Yeah. So the second one was my ear. Okay. 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 So, okay. Yeah. So he came in and, you know, he had heart issues and all this stuff. And then I look at his ear and his crease. Oh, uh, the, the, Frank yeah. Sign. What's that called? Yeah. What's that? It's, it's called Frank Stein. Frank Stein. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Am it's, I it's, looking okay, David? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it shows, uh, shows a derm dermatological uh, sign of having coronary, coronary disease. So, um, I, I just happened to see it and I took a picture of it and then uh, I put it up and then I went and looked at the mirror and I'm like, huh, I have one too, um, which makes perfect sense since I just had a um, <clears throat> quad bypass. So, um, you know, the reason that that reminded me uh, of looking at something like that is because on May 11th, I had a uh, quadruple bypass. It started um, end of April, beginning of May, where uh, my wife has been bugging me for me to go get a CT of my heart done, not because I had any kind of symptoms or signs, you know, I, I was I thought I was perfectly healthy. I do have family history, though, um, you know, heart disease, um, high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes. Um, so I've been on medication for years. Uh, everything was under control. So I thought I was just fine. But I just did it to uh, kind of appease my wife from bugging me so much. Sorry uh, to interrupt, but how old are you, David, if you don't mind sharing? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm 51. Okay. Okay. Sorry about No, not at all. So and, and I, what was the age of of your you told us in the uh, pre-interview what was the age of some of your relatives who had who had had cardiac events? Yeah, so my father passed away when he was fifty three years old. Uh, my grandfather passed away when he was fifty. So um, my wife had a good reason to worry. Sure, uh, sure. And you know, I took, but I was always telling her, listen, you know, they come from an age where. You know, medication is not really something they did. They, they took. They, you know, uh, I, you know, we come from South Korea, and my father really didn't understand. Like he would go on medication, and as soon as his doctor said everything is fine, he will get off the medication. And you know, uh, so you know, it was a different generation. So I thought I was fine. So I went and had a CT scan done. And CT scan is not definitive, and they can't really tell you if it's the uh, any calcification is in the inside the artery or outside of it. Um, but definitely, it showed some blockage. So I went and had a uh, angiogram done uh, right away, which actually showed 100% uh, blockage on one of my arteries. 
<clears throat> and over 95% blockage on what uh, most people know as the Widowmaker. So at that point, that is just beginning of May, uh, my wife had, uh, she's like a soldier. She, she, she's awesome. So she went and, you know, researched all these different facilities where I can go and got me into the top surgeon in uh, Cedar sinai So surgery happened uh, May 11th. Um, you know, so quad. Um, <clears throat> so my heart surgery basically went were like clockwork. No issues, nothing big deal. The surgeon came out in, you know, three and a half hours or so, told my wife, you know, hey, that, it, it went beautiful and he has zero heart damage. So he's got a 100% new lease in life and he's going to li live a very long time. And this, you know, now I'm going home. Um, so uh, Cedar is a uh, teaching facility. So they had, you know, uh, students and other people was closing me up. And when they turned me over, um, they saw my arm. Uh, and this is a question people always ask, why did they take, uh, you know, a piece of artery from my arm, uh, not, not my leg? They did. But um, because of me being so young, if they take it from your uh, one from my arm, those are uh, healthier, that they, they are stronger and it will actually last a lifetime in my heart. So um, we had talked about that, and so that, that's what they end up doing. Um, but at that time, they saw my arm had, you know, like doubled in size, basically, um, you know, blood pulled, and, and um, it, was, it was big, so that um, they knew that, um, which I didn't even know anything about uh, compartment syndrome, but... You know that they knew what that it was, and they um, went ahead and uh, paged a surgeon to come down and uh, help with the situation. And my wife, at the same time, was going, "There's no way he's gonna lose his arm." Um, and so she was uh, busy calling friends and family members who are in medicine to find a locate a surgeon for me uh funny thing was that the surgeon that would just happen to be at the hospital was scheduled to do a different surgery that that they pulled him from was the exact same surgeon that my wife got the name from for so um you know i you know they said i'm always lucky um so here it is i i, I was a lucky guy so the surgeon came down and made the uh, proper call and made it made a basically incision from about my elbow area all the way down past um, my carpal tunnel. And, you know, when I first woke up, you know, I was still groggy and I, you know, I was under coming out of, um, you know, anesthesia. So I, I didn't notice anything, um, but my arm was, you know, still, uh, it was all wrapped up. It was big and, and my hand was completely cold. Um, they couldn't find uh, any pulse and you know I, I couldn't really answer them because I um, to figure out what was going on so um, th the surgeon told that there was decent chance that I would lose my left arm um, mm. uh, but about 12 hours later well, shit, you got a robot. Who cares about that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just figure I can just, you know, uh, attach a, you know, mirror on my stump on my elbow and I can still do yeah. ministry. But uh, uh, when, you know, about 12 hours pass and, and I was, you know, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I was intubated. So uh, about that time, intubation came out and I can finally talk and stuff. Um, that my hands start to get warmer and I uh, start to get uh, feelings in my arm uh, and, and my fingertips and I was able to move them. So, um, and it just started to get better and better. So um, they said, you know, I, 
like I say, I just never thought much of it because I didn't know anything about the compartment syndrome. I just figured that's just the way things happen. And, you know, I was going to be just fine. Um, and my wife always just pushed the positive because, you know, I, it, you know, that's what they tell you to do when they're coming out of, uh, when you're intubated, you know, always focus on the positive so that you can get at the intubation uh, as soon as possible. So, uh, she really didn't tell me, you know, how grave or serious uh, my arm was. So now, um, you know, I, I just saw the surgeon. He says that, you know, I will have somewhere between 95% to 100% back of everything I had before. I just have a tiniest little um, numbness um, below my thumb um, toward my wrist. And so, you know, it's something that I can live with, even if it doesn't fully come back. Um, so I'm just grateful and, you know, lucky. And, you know, what happened, because people are always mad, this happened to me, this happened to you. But, you know, you got to focus on the positive, of, you know, about your life and how you feel. Because, <clears throat> you know, really with having a quadruple bypass in two weeks time, I feel like I could have come back, came back to work. You know, I couldn't come back to work right away at that point is because of my arm, because I still had an open wound. Right. Um, so, you know, I had three surgeries to close it. So once that happened, <clears throat> you know, my wife wanted me to, you know, not come back to work right away. So I gave it another week. So it took me like six weeks to get back, which, you know, when you look at it, uh, you know, I am so blessed because my doctors told me there is no way you're going back to work three to six months post. There's no way. Don't even think about it. It's not happening. And I came, you know, even with the stupid compartment syndrome, I was back in six weeks. Crazy, David. We're we're really close on. Look on at these time pictures, now. Jeff. Yeah. No, no. I mean that it's just amazing. But well, I I have a I have an overarching question here though, is is how did going through all this probably at a point in your life where you weren't expecting to go through all this, how did that change your your view of of like your professional life? How do you? Did, did it change your perspectives on, on dentistry or your profession in any way? So I, I guess for me, it didn't really change too much. Only reason I say that is my life really changed me when my son was born. Um, mm -hmm. I was the guy who took zero days off, you know, when I first started. I was always afraid of, Hey, if I'm not be there for my patient, they can go somewhere else and, you know, this and that. I got to get my practice running. My son was born and, you know, something just clicked in my head. It changed. And I wanted to make sure that, um, not that I had a terrible life growing up, I, I just didn't have the type of uh, life maybe I always wanted. Um, I didn't really, you know, I went on one vacation until I went to college entire you know since i've been in the united states um i didn't want that for my son i wanted more time with my son just uh having to gone through when my father passed away when uh passing away so young um i had a different perspective so i have a goal of you know whatever you know i, I can get away with you know I, I take minimum three to four large vacations every year um taking my son all over the world and uh, you know, I, it's, so I, I, I've already had that kind of come to Jesus talk with myself, you know, uh, back in 2012, um, as far as dentistry goes, and I just love dentistry. So like, I'm not the guy who goes, Oh, I'm going to miss dentistry. I'm like, I'm, I thank God every day when I go to work. Um, I, I, I just love what I do. Um, only thing when I was going to go through surgery was more, of you know, my wife asked what, what, what I worried about the most. And because of, I knew the type of surgery because I, my heart was good. It, it's not like I was going into the surgery after having a heart attack. Uh, my, my mortality rate was only 1%. So, 
So I wasn't really worried about dying. I was more worried about, hey, if I'm out six months, I am, how am I going to support my team members? Mm -hmm. I'm going to take care of my patients. I know that, um, and how is my son going to deal with this? Because I know my wife is strong, and I know she'll be with me, and uh, we'll kind of go through things together. But, you know, like I have two offices, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like, how am I going to support everybody? How am I going to support my associate? I, you know, I promised her I would be there to, you know, help her learn and help her to get better. And so, it, it, you know, in that sense, I, you know, I've worried about um, my responsibilities, I guess. Um, but, you know, as far as life goes, you know, I, I, why my wife knows, I'm like, I live every day the way I want to live. And so, like, if I went tomorrow, only regrets is that I won't be able to see my son grow up. Besides that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty good in life. Great stuff, David. David, I tell you what, man, I, um, I'm, I, I'm better for knowing you. This has been an incredible conversation. I cannot thank you enough for being here. What a, I, you sure as hell didn't think you'd have compartment syndrome, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> yeah. And and you know, earlier in the conversation, before we got on the show, you said you were kind of a mutt, but you know, dude, you've got pretty damn good genes. I would have never guessed you were 40, 51. I thought you were gonna say you're like 43, <laughs> oh, that, that, that's dude. Great. And and, that's and after a heart you. surgery at that. <laughs> Holy shit, man. Yeah. I want your genes. Whatever you're drinking, dude, I'm gonna have it. I, I want his I want his set. <laughs> <laughs> hey David, can we can we hang out sometime, brother? Absolutely, love to. Uh, All right, well, we're we're over, but I, I it was worth every freaking minute of it. It was an amazing conversation. I thank you so much for being here. Thank uh, you for having me. If, Thanks, if anybody, David. great to know you. If anybody missed anything tonight, just listen to the last minute of that interview when he talks about his love for his son, his his zest for tomorrow. There's nothing more in life than that, man. Jeff and I are big family people. Jennifer's a big family person. We get every bit of it, dude. You're awesome. And your wife, man, she she must be awesome because uh, you kind of gave her a lot of kudos too. So, and I know her name's Felicia just through through uh, through social media. So, Felicia, thank you for letting us have David tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks so man. much, David. Let's, let's do this again soon, okay? Absolutely. Thank All you. Right. up another podcast for dentists in the know on behalf of dr jennifer bell dr chad duplantis and myself remember that we've got a great profession so let's make it a great day dinks